Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. It's been a while since we prayed. My grandmother always said you ought to do that before you do anything. It seems to go better. Let's pray a little bit more. Dear God, use me tonight as an instrument of thy will. Speak through me so whatever results that you desire here tonight will be accomplished in all things. Thy will, not mine, be done. Amen. What I love most about AA, by the time I'm done, you're going to know I love everything about AA is the simplicity of it. I'm a very simple guy. There's a line in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I don't know what page and what chapter. Alcoholics Anonymous is a design for living, not an exercise in memorization. But there, there's, a, there's a line in there that bottom lines the simplicity of Alcoholics Anonymous for me. And what that line says is simply this. Remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. The single most important fact in my life as I stand here tonight and the only reason I'm standing here tonight is that I got a power in my life that I choose to call God who does for me one day at a time what I could never do for myself. If I had the power to quit drinking on my own, I'd have never come to AA. Why should I? I didn't come here because I was bored. I didn't come here because I was lonely. I didn't come here because I was looking for a new hobby. I came here because I'm powerless over alcohol and I can't manage my own life. And as a result of coming here, I have gained access to a power greater than myself at one day at a time. I love how Bill Wilson wrote, I have been rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence into the level of life better than the best that I've ever known. And that don't mean I don't have problems. And that's the reason that I pray before I introduce me from behind the podium. It is to keep me grounded and centered in the truth. And the truth is simply this. Left to my own devices, I absolutely guarantee you I would have destroyed myself years ago. My two best drinking buddies ain't in AA. They ain't in treatment. They ain't in the penitentiary. And they ain't in a mental institution. They are in Oakland Cemetery in Sandusky, Ohio. And they are there as a direct result of the disease of alcoholism. And they died very young men. So that's the reason that I pray before I tell you who I am. That prayer keeps me reminded of two things I believe are vital and crucial to me staying here. First and foremost, the reason I'm at Pine Lake tonight is to do God's will, not mine. And it also serves to remind me that he is in charge here tonight. And as always, thank God. I am not. Good evening. My name is Kent Coleman. I'm an alcoholic. I'm... My parents raised me right. If my mother was here, she'd jump up and say, you ain't turn out right. But anyway, um, <laughs> my parents raised me right. I want to thank this group for the invitation to be here. Uh, we've been trying to do this for two or three years, and we couldn't get it to match up, and we finally did. Um, so I, I want to thank this group for the honor and privilege of participating in this meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you, Pixie. Thank you, Mark. Um, all of the people who are responsible for me being here. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to participate in the life-giving, life-changing, life-saving fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at any level, not just doing things like this, but setting up and cleaning up at my home group, going into the jails, the institutions, the halfway houses, the detoxes, all of the things I've been blessed to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous, if you knew in here, is a program of give, then get, not a program of get, then give. Right. So when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, that didn't make any sense to me. My grandmother used to tell me that. She used to say, the more you give, the more you get. I used to, th- I used to think, where'd you go to school? Uh, so uh, it, it is an honor and a privilege to, how can you possibly outgive a fellowship that restores life to the living dead? I don't know about nobody else in here, but when I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, mentally, physically, and spiritually, I was more dead than alive. And um, it, so it's an honor and a privilege to be asked to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. So thank you. Um, congratulations to all of the September birthday people in here. Um, and I want to talk for a minute to our new friends here tonight. Um, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't come here with AA etiquette. I didn't know what an open meeting was. I didn't know what a closed meeting was. I didn't know what a sponsor was. I didn't know a big book from a Ram McNally Atlas when I came up in here. And uh, so I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous exactly as I was. And that was not a good person. 
I had the word mother wrapped around every other thing that I said. I didn't come here from Sunday school, right? Nobody sprinkled pixie dust over my head, and all of a sudden I understood AA and knew how to conduct myself in an AA meeting. No, I didn't, right? And I thank God for the long-term members of Alcoholics Anonymous in my area who never made me feel less than, who never made me feel unwanted, who sat me down and shared with me, because that's what we do in here, how this thing works. And uh, and so if you're new here tonight, I want to welcome you, um, as my friend Ralph says, to the biggest step you're going to take from the cradle to the grave, right? And I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, and like I said, I didn't know anybody that had ever been here before. And uh, and so I, I, I start coming to AA meetings, and um, I'm a street guy, and a street guy stays alive by doing two things, watching and listening, that's how you stay alive in the street. That is the skill set that I bought into Alcoholics Anonymous. So I came here and I started watching and listening. And uh, I got sober in a place in Sandusky where I went to most meetings when I was new. It was a place called the Erie Easy Does It Club. And it was a typical AA clubhouse. Most of the people there were new. There was a lot of stuff going on that shouldn't have been going on. And I felt very comfortable there, right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And, and I start watching people at the Erie Easy Dozen Club, and I saw two really distinct groups of people. People who were staying sober continuously a day at a time, and people who were not. Dr. Bob Smith, co-founder of AA, said, there's only two groups of people you got to watch in here, people staying sober and people who aren't. And if you're new in here, you can learn everything you need to know about Alcoholics Anonymous and never have to open your mouth. Just watch these two groups, groups of people. The first group of people, the people that weren't staying sober, I call them group one, they was in and out, in and out. Every time they came back in from being out, I noticed they look worse than the last time they came back in from being out. I didn't see none of them come back passing out $50 bills and driving a new BMW and talking about how good it was out there, right? They came in, they talked of being restless, irritable, and discontented and full of terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. We'll call them group one. Then there was group two. And group two, you saw some group two people here tonight when they was asking for people to do a little service tonight. Them is the people who raised their hand. Those are the people who set this meeting up. You'll see them at any AA meeting you go to. They're greeting people at the door. They're setting up the tables and chairs. They're making the coffee. They talk about God, big book, steps, spirituality, and enjoying life sober. We'll call them group two. Now, my story is going to prove that I am no rocket scientist, but it sure looked to me like these people in group two had a heck of a better deal than the people in group one, right? So being a simple guy, I asked myself, what are these people doing that these people aren't? Right? Well, the people in group two had some things in common. They had something called a sponsor. Now, I didn't know what a sponsor was when I got here. I used to play softball for Cronin's Tavern. They was our sponsor. <laughs> and I got a lot of free booze and clothes out of that deal, right? So I thought, well, maybe I should get me one of these sponsors in here, right? And the old timers at home sat me down and they told me what a sponsor was. They told me that a sponsor is somebody who has working knowledge and experience with the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous as outlined by the founders in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous who is willing to take the time to sit down with you and walk you through the program of recovery out of that book page by page and just as importantly, matter of fact, in, in my opinion, even more importantly, is a living demonstration of those principles in their life who can show you what your life can be like if you do what they do. Notice I said working knowledge and experience, not book knowledge and experience. I had a college degree when I got here. I know how to read. What I don't know how to do is live sober. Right? I have sponsorship in Alcoholics Anonymous today. He's already been mentioned. My sponsor was your speaker last month, Bob D. in Las Vegas. Um, I was raised in Alcoholics Anonymous by the late Bill Finley in Lorraine, Ohio, and Kenny Bombalicki in Cleveland. Bill died 52 years sober. Kenny now has 44. Bob has 38. That's the least impressive thing I can tell you about him. I can tell you this. I have never had a phone conversation with a sponsor that I've been blessed to have in this program that asked me, where are you going tonight? What they've always done is tell me where they were going tonight. See, the power of example has been huge in my life. So if you knew in here tonight, I, I want to share a couple of things with you about sponsorship. I'm a guy that sponsors a lot of people. I, matter of fact, I sponsor somebody in Seattle. Um, and uh, he's not here tonight. He's in Pittsburgh visiting his family. Boy, that's going to any lengths not to see your sponsor, ain't it? Right? But uh, 
I want to share a couple things with you about sponsorship. Having a sponsor is a great thing. Trust me, it's a huge thing. Being sponsorable is even better. Right. Some guy asked me recently, I sponsor guys all over the states, overseas. I work intensively with other alcoholics. That's what I do. Some guy said to me recently, Ken, how many people do you sponsor? I said, oh, about half of them. <laughs> right. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about. If you know it here, sponsorship, like everything else in Alcoholics Anonymous, will only avail you to the point that you are willing to take advantage of it. In other words, if you don't use it, it's no good to you. Now, it's something... Now, when I came here, I, I do this sometime, and it's a big meeting. Would everybody that's in here right now who would be willing to sponsor a new person in AA, would you please raise your hand? Thank you very much. If you knew and you ain't got a sponsor, I just hooked you up, <laughs> right? No one ever need leave an AA meeting without the benefit of sponsorship. And if you're anything like me, when I came here, I don't know you. And I don't know if you got 10 years or 10 minutes, nor do I know whether or not you're willing to help a guy like me who didn't even feel he deserved any help. So if you're new here, the help that you need just identified itself. What you do with that information is up to you. Another thing those people in group two had in common was something called a home group. And um, I have a home group today. It's the Friday Night Venice Group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Sandusky, Ohio. Um, we've been around for a while. We started as an Oxford group meeting in 1938. So we've been around for a while. And there's a lot of groups like that in my area that are, are old like that. What I will tell you about my group, it ain't the best group in the world. It ain't the worst group in the world. It's just an AA group. One of the things my sponsor Bill taught me when I came here is it's okay to stop competing now. Alcoholics Anonymous is not a competition of better than or less than. Before I came here, everything in my life was lived better than or less than. And a funny thing happens when I live better than or less than, I am never a part of. Tradition one, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Alcoholism is a disease that thrives on difference and separation, and it wants to keep me separate. That's why when you knew and you come here, you, your disease is still active, of course, because it hasn't been treated. And the first thing it does is it starts to compare rather than identify, right? And I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's the first thing I started doing is comparing. It was terrible. I heard stories of homelessness in here when I got to Alcoholics. It was terrible. And uh, I was sitting at a meeting and uh, I said, uh, you know, uh, I ain't never been homeless. And there was a man at that meeting, his name was Jim Redmond, God rest his soul, he died 53 years sober. He was sitting in the back. And here's the thing that really upset me about this. It was not his turn to share. <laughs> And I made that statement, and Jim Redman goes, really? He said, son, he said, I got some bad news for you. He said, if you grown and you living in your mom and daddy's house and you ain't paying no rent, you homeless. <laughs> <laughs> that man hurt my feelings. I hope I didn't step on no toes in here tonight, but the truth will set you free, right? <laughs> so I got this home group, right? And um, our primary purpose is to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. I think we do a pretty good job of that, and we have a lot of fun in the process. If you come to my home group, you're going to know you've been at an AA meeting. You're not going to be ignored. You're not going to be looked down upon because you have a slip to be signed. I don't want to get off into this tonight, but um, if somebody come to your home group, and they brand new, and I'm sitting in the parking lot, and I watch them walk in. When they come out after an hour, and I call them over to my car, and I ask them, what did you find in there? What would they tell me? And for that, I am responsible. And that's what I like to call the total package in Alcoholics Anonymous. Sponsorship, big book and steps, home group and service. The three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous. The three legs on the stool I used to talk about. In my experience, I have yet to meet an alcoholic of our type. And if you don't know what an alcoholic of our type is, read the book. I have yet to meet an alcoholic of our type who's come in here 
taken those things, applied them to their life one day at a time to the best of their ability and gone back out here and taken a drink. I have not seen it happen one single time. If you knew in here the program of recovery was designed for success, not for failure. I have not seen it fail one single time. But on the flip side of the coin, I have yet to see an alcoholic of our type come in here, ignore those things, and stay sane, sober, or happy for any appreciable length of time. The simplicity of Alcoholics Anonymous. Those who do get and those who don't, don't. And it's just that simple. I never sat in the bar room and watched somebody across the bar drinking and thought I was going to get drunk watching them drink. That's just as ridiculous as me coming in here watching you get a sponsor, work the steps, get a home group and get active and think that somehow magically it's going to rub off on me. Those who do get and those who don't, don't. And it's just that simple. The 12th step does not say having had a spiritual awakening as a result of attendance. Right? <laughs> Meeting attendance is great. Meetings, meetings, meetings. Go to as many meetings as you can. I don't care how long as you've been. So go to meetings, right? Read the literature. We, this is a great time to be a member of AA. We got more meetings than ever. We got literature, conferences, conventions, workshops going on all over the place. The dissemination of information in Alcoholics Anonymous is at an all-time high in 2016. Right, But all of those things have a purpose, and their purpose is to support and facilitate the 12 steps in my life. They're not a substitute for them. And when I understood that, Alcoholics Anonymous started making some sense. Right. There was a guy that said to me when I was new, don't drink and come to these meetings and you'll be fine. I looked at him and said, if I could not drink, I wouldn't need to come to these meetings. You got anything else? And he turned and walked away from me. I heard a guy say one time, go to 90 meetings in 90 days. You ever heard that? Go to 90 meetings in 90 days. Boy, that excited me when I was new. Oh, 90 days and I'm out of here. Right? <laughs> I went to the old timer in our group, John C. John came into Alcoholics Anonymous in 1945. And I went to John and I said, John, how long do I have to go to these meetings? I wanted him to say 90 days. And John looked at me and said, till you decide you want to drink again. That's not the answer that I wanted. So I went to somebody else because I do that when I'm new, right? I shop for answers. <laughs> and I said to Bill, Bill, is 90 meetings, is that what you want me? He looked at me and he said, where do you get this nonsense? He said, we don't have quarterly recovery in here. <laughs> we stay sober a day at a time. Those are things that have come into Alcoholics Anonymous. I need to be careful of the things that I repeat in here. My first sponsor told me something that has served me very well for almost a quarter of a century. If it ain't in the book, leave it alone. Because you're playing your bet your life in here. If it ain't in the book, leave it alone. Well-intentioned people, I, I got, I, they mean no harm. But my life depends on this. My life depends on this. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know what an alcoholic was either. I always thought I knew what an alcoholic was. I always had a definition of alcoholism. I like to say my definitions of alcoholism it was a sliding definition. Because as my disease progressed, I kept fitting my definitions. So every time I fit it, I'd have to lower the bar a little bit. When I was a teenager, if you'd have asked me what an alcoholic was, I would have told you it's somebody that's drunk every day. Now, I don't know where I got that from, and I know today that that's not true, but that's what I would have told you. As a teenager, I became a daily drinker. Er, that ain't it. An alcoholic, I thought, is somebody who misses work, school, or ball practice or important things in life because of drinking. It interferes with your priorities in life. Yes, that must be an alcoholic. As a teenager, alcohol began to interfere with work, school, and important things in life, right? Er, that ain't it. I thought about it some more. I finally figured it out. An alcoholic is somebody who goes to jail because of drinking, right? As you hear in a few minutes, I really had to change that one. By the time I staggered into Alcoholics Anonymous, my definition of an alcoholic when I got here, y'all remember Otis on the Andy Griffith show? Y'all remember Otis? Otis clothes was always wrinkled. He always had a cheap pint of wine on him. He's in and out of jail. I watch every episode of the Andy Griffith show. I don't remember Otis working no place, right? <laughs> that definitely must be. I was over in uh, London, England, speaking at a big convention, and I asked them that same question. I said, y'all remember Otis on the Andy Griffith show? And 2,000 people went. No. Yeah. Right. 
That set me back like 10 minutes, right? <laughs> what do you mean, no, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, long trench coat, stocking cap, drinking wild Irish rose, mad dog, a thunderbird, out of brown paper sack, sleeping under a cardboard box. Yes, that must be an alcoholic. That was my definition when I got to you, and the reason that it was is because that's the only thing that had not yet happened to me. And if I didn't have the family that I had, that's exactly where I would have been. I can stand here tonight in all honesty and tell you I drank in Wino's Alley in Sandusky, Ohio with them old men when I was a teenager. Um, I know what it's like to put 50 cent on a wine at 7 o'clock in the morning. Right. Only difference between me and them old men, there was still somebody to open the door for me when it got dark and there was nobody left to do it for them. Right. So what is this thing called alcoholism? I love the way that our book is laid out. It's laid out in three parts. What is the problem? What is the solution? Then it gives me a practical program of action to apply the solution to my life. First part, the problem. Go to doctor's opinion. Right. I suffer from a disease, an illness, a malady. All right. Thank you. That is mental, physical, and spiritual. The mental part of it we call a mental obsession to drink. What is an obsession? An obsession is a thought so strong that will override or overcome any thinking that I can raise as a defense against it. What are some of the mental defenses I tried to raise against taking the first drink? Well, I tried common sense. That was stupid. I'm not going to do that again, right? <laughs> and then I did it later that afternoon. My grandmother told me when I got sober, she said, boy, the reason that didn't work is you wasn't born with none of that. Uh... I tried willpower, right? I'm just not going to do that no more. I, that, I've had enough of that nonsense, right? A guy told me one time, using an alcoholic using willpower, is, it's like eat a box of X-Lax and use your willpower not to go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> That's, it works about as well, right? I tried self-knowledge, right? I, I, 1978, I sat in the pump lounge and I said to a kid named Brian, if I drink that bottle of beer, I'm not going to do one single solitary thing that I told you that I got to do today. And I don't know where that came from. A moment of truth. You have those sometime, you know. He looked at me and he said, well, if you know that, then don't drink it. Right? And I said, but no, now that I know that, I should be all right. Right? And I drank it. And of course, I, I didn't do one single solitary thing that I needed to do that day. Right? I try, you try this one, fear of consequences if, if I drink, right? I'm in my late teens and early 20s, and I'm waking up in the morning and laying in the bed and mentally making a list of all the reasons I ain't going to drink today. If I drink today, I'm going to get kicked off the team, lose my job, get kicked out of the house, flunk out of school, a dirty urine, I'm going to prison. All them things true in my life at one time or another. And if you drink like I drink, usually three or four of them going on at once, right? So I would lay there, take a look at the truth, and make the easiest kind of decision that there is to make. I don't want those things, consequences in my life. Therefore, I am not drinking. And I meant it as much as I mean it tonight. I was not joking. Put a lie detector on me, the needle wouldn't have moved. I am not drinking, right? And our book refers to that as sound reasoning. And it is sound reasoning, isn't it? Sound reasoning. Our book then goes on to say that parallel to this sound reasoning ran some insanely, let's circle the word insanely, trivial excuse to take a drink because then I get out of the bed <laughs> and about two minutes later here's the thought that comes to me if you knew follow me for a minute it's Friday <laughs> it's Friday and you know I have worked all week which for me is three days And you know, this is, none of this is really my fault. This is the United States of America. I'm grown. I ain't hurting anybody. And by God, I deserve a beer. Is anybody following this? Right? And here's the kicker. If you're new, all of that sound reasoning, the truth from five minutes before, never even comes back. In the, in the chapter, more about alcoholism, they say there, there's no fight. It's not like there's a debate about it. It's like, bam, like a radar, right? I deserve a drink. So I pick up the drink and I drink it. And the second part of the disease, Silkworth called it an allergy to alcohol. He referred to it as the phenomenon of craving. Simple story. Hot day like it's hot right now in here. Uh, 
I'm, out, I'm sober 10 or 12 years. I'm out riding on my lawnmower, cutting my grass. So is my non-alcoholic next door neighbor. I'm watching him over there. He gets hot and thirsty. He shuts his lawnmower off. He gets off it. He walks over to his deck. He fills up in the cooler. It's full of cold beer. He pulls out a cold one. He pops the top on her. He sucks it down. It quenches his thirst. And nobody in this room is going to believe it. But I've seen this with my own two eyes. With that full cooler of beer still sitting there, that man actually got back on his lawnmower and finished cutting his grass. I'm over here 10 years sober and I'm going because mm -hmm. I don't get that, right? Because if you like me, if you're new, when I drink a bottle of beer, it don't quench my thirst. What it does to me and maybe to you is it makes me thirstier. And that is what they call the phenomenon of craving. I am a person whose body does not properly metabolize alcohol. It sets up in me an unqu it's an unquenchable, unsatisfiable hunger for more. And grass cutting is over at the Coleman house. <laughs> My lawnmower will be sitting in that same spot two weeks from now when I get out of the county. <laughs> Spiritual malady, soul sickness. My disease, my disease is rooted in selfishness and self-centeredness. I'm a guy who made a conscious decision at the age of 14 to call his own shots. Don't need you, don't need God, don't need nobody else. I'm smarter than the average bear. And as a result of that, I set out to try to control and manipulate the people, places, and things in my life to satisfy those basic desires and instincts that Bill talks about in the 12 and 12, the des desire for sex, security, companionship, all of those things. Our book refers to it as plain God, right? And there's a small problem with that when you try to control the people, places, and things in your life to satisfy your own needs. The people, places, and things in your life refuse to cooperate. <laughs> and as a result of that, I become even more restless, irritable, and discontented, and I push or pull even harder. Whatever I think is going to take to work, it still doesn't work. And I learned at the age of 14, if I pour alcohol on restless, irritable, discontented, and afraid, it produces in me something called a sense of ease and comfort. And you've seen it a million times. A guy walks into the bar room. You can see the weight of the world on his back. That finger goes up. That drink comes down. He throws it down, and he goes, <sighs> does anybody know what I'm talking about? This disease of mind, body, and spirit is called alcoholism. And if you got it, and I don't know if you do, but I definitely do, and I don't treat it, death, imprisonment, or commitment are guaranteed me. And if you're new here and you don't understand or believe that, stick around and watch what happens to the people who don't. I'm now 57 years old. I was born in the city of Sandusky, Ohio, with the second of three boys. I was raised in a Christian home. Uh, I had as fine a mother and father that have ever graced this earth. I'm the son of Pete and Evelyn Coleman. Um, my mother was the um, president of Ohio Baptist Women's Convention. All them famous people you see on in religion and civil rights. Some people been in my house. That is that I wasn't sent to church. I was taken to church. My father was the commissioner of the youth football and baseball leagues in the city of Sandusky. My mother's older brother was a two-term mayor in the city of Sandusky. That is the type of family that I come from. Uh, we were taught the difference between right and wrong. My mother worked for Chrysler Corporation. My father worked for General Motors. I'm retired from Ford. And uh, I mean, we had a lot of craziness in the house, but we had really nice cars. But anyway, uh, <laughs> man, we grew up $100 tennis shoes in the early 1970s. We went on vacations every year. Um, I had the kind of life that kids dream about having. We, we were, sports were big in our town. Sports were big in our lives. There's somebody here from Norwalk. We were talking about it earlier. I come from a place that was one of the top five high school football programs in the country for a long, long time. And I mean, we, we played everything in season. We just had a great time. We ice skated in the winter time. We went sledding and tobogganing. I mean, we just, that's the life that I had growing up. And, um, But it was never enough for me. Um, as a kid, I was shy, insecure, and afraid. Um, I was the kind of kid who, I would rather be by myself than be around other people. Um, I like to read a lot. I like to daydream a lot. I used to love to go to the library when I was a little boy. I could read before I went to school, which really served me well when I got to school. Um, 
I would sit up on the roof of the house for hours at a time and daydream about being somebody else, someplace else, doing something else. I look back now, you know, Bob B says, you know, life is lived forward and understood backwards. I, I, I look back on that time in my life now and I realize I was beginning already to seek different avenues of escape from reality. The, the reality of my life as it existed, truly existed, was an uncomfortable place for me. So I start looking for something to make that feel better inside me. And so uh, reading did it for a while, watching TV, that kind of thing. Um, eventually my first real drink of choice was my older brother. I come from a football family. Um, my father played at West Virginia State University. My uncle Bo played at Penn State. I had two cousins that played in the National Football League for over 10 years. That's what my family do. We play football on Saturdays and Sundays, and we do it in front of a lot of people. And that, that's what we were raised to do. There was no pictures of us as babies on a bearskin rug. We was in diapers in a three-point stance in the middle of the living room. That's a true story. That was my daddy. And, uh, and I had a brother that by the time he was 16 years old, he was six foot two, he weighed 215 pounds, and he could run a 4 4 40 on a cinder track. And, um, and he was a, a running back, which is a big running back in the early, in the early 1970s. And, um, I had a cousin who was an All-American at the University of Michigan, and we thought he was going to go there. And, uh, we had a coach at Ohio State, his name was Woody Hayes, and Woody Hayes came to our home one afternoon. And in about a 10 minute conversation, my brother was going to Ohio State. And uh, and I followed my brother everywhere that he went. I lived in his shadow. I had ease and comfort in his shadow. I was not referred to as Kent. I was referred to as Brian's little brother. Is anybody in here following me? I followed him everywhere he went, and I hid behind him. He was my first real drink of choice. I, I had ease and comfort in his shadow. In 1972, uh, we went to Maslin, Ohio, to scrimmage the Maslin Tigers, and um. Uh, my brother suffered a head injury at the end of that scrimmage. I'm going to make a long story short. Nine hours of brain surgery on Monday. He died Wednesday, September the 5th, 1972. I remember like it was yesterday. Is that what made me alcoholic? Absolutely not. Stop any car out on the street. Tragedies happen. People live. People die. People in here can tell similar stories. What did it do to me? Looking back at it now, what I can say is that it seemed to accentuate the feelings of difference and separation that I was already feeling. Right. Um, Because now everywhere that I go, there's an elephant in the room. I'm the guy whose brother died. It's 1972, not 2016. They did not send counselors to the high school to help us deal with that. Everybody had to deal with it on their own. I didn't bother my mom and dad about it because th this almost killed my mom and daddy. And I'm not going to tell you what it did to my grandparents. Right. Um, Changed sports at Sandusky High School forever. It has never been the same. And um, and that was in 1972. And so uh, my mom used to talk to me a lot after my brother died, and she would tell me things like, Kenny, God has been so good to you. One of these days you're going to have a really good life and help other people. I used to look at my mother like she had three heads. And I used to tell her, you know, I don't know where you get this stuff from, but if you want to know what I want out of life, I can tell you in 30 seconds. I want mine. I want to get it my way, and I'm going to need you to leave me alone while I'm doing it. And my mom would get, you know how they get that sad look on their face when they got a crazy son, right? <laughs> Oh, we didn't raise you that way. You don't get it. And I would point my finger at her and say, no, nah, you the one who don't get it. If you don't think my way is going to work, get out of the way and watch me roll. And, and that's me at the age of 13. Um, so I'm 13 years old. I'm standing on the street corner with guys I've known my entire life. Right? Known them since I was two years old. Go to school with them, go to church with them, play ball with them. Known them my entire life. I feel absolutely and totally disconnected. Top piece of conversation amongst our crew in 1932 at the age of 13 was drinking beer, smoking weed, and climbing in and out of girls' bedroom windows in the middle of the night. And I was batting zero, zero, zero. I had a mother that did not play that. I went to school, church, ball practice, and home. Right? So I don't even know what they're talking about, but I don't let them know that, that I don't know what they're talking about. Y'all remember them dogs they used to put in the back window of the car with the head that go like this? That's me. Oh, yeah, I did that. Ain't that fun? I was over there. I'm 13 years old. I'm telling people I've been places I ain't been. I know people I don't know. I've done things that I, have, that I haven't done. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I am willing to go to any length to gain your approval. I was addicted to approval long before I picked up a drink. I am looking for something outside of me to fix this discontent, this angst that is inside of me. And um, one of the gifts God did give me is I did well in school. That's a gift from God. So I, I was not challenged by school. School came easy for me. Um, my first sponsor told me um, after about a month of, of me, him being my sponsor, we was riding in his van one day and he turned and he looked at me and he said, son, he said, anytime you're in a room alone, all your enemies are there. And what he was referring to is my thinking. Uh, 
So I'm 13 years old. I'm sitting in study hall at Sandusky High School, and I have a visit from the enemy, my thinking. And here's the thought that occurred to me. Now, I was older than 13. I was 14. I'm sitting, and here's the thought that come to me. You know, these people in this study hall are breaking their neck trying to get B's and C's taking general math and science. I'm taking calculus, physics, fourth year Latin, fourth year English. I'm sleeping in class and getting straight A's. You know, it just might be entirely possible that I know everything. <laughs> Y'all know where this is going, don't you? Straight to the penitentiary. No, I, I accepted that thought as a fact. I left the room and I took action. I actually went home and told that to my mother and father. I thought they ought to know. It would change things around the house a little bit. And uh, they was watching this, the evening news of Walter Cronkite and I stood in the middle of the living room and I told them that. Um, I was always scared of my daddy. My daddy played football when they didn't have face masks. Uh, my father was a decorated veteran from the Korean conflict. Um, the big medals, those letters of commendation. Um, my father was in the woods in Korea, um, and he he moved off that couch really quick when I said that. <laughs> and I decided right then and there not to stay and see what he wanted. I broke for the screen door. I got out the screen door and I closed it. And to the day he died, I never asked him what he intended to do to me that day. He must have been thinking, hey, look what we got in the house. I'm going to kill it. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> I got outside the screen door. I'm looking at him. He looked at me, and my dad pointed his finger at me, and he said, Kenny, he said, I'm going to tell you something, boy. He said, you're going to have a hard life. He said, because don't nobody know everything. And I stood on that porch, and I looked my father in his eye, and I laughed in his face. And that was a significant day in my life, because on that day, I closed the door. Our book says that honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness are the three essentials of recovery. I believe that they are the three essentials of human growth, whether you're alcoholic or not. On that day, I closed the door. Everybody in my life became an idiot. A closed mind cannot learn. It cannot grow. My mother, my father, the preacher, the teacher, later on, the police, the judges, the lawyer, the probation, the PO, you can't tell me, because if I don't know it, it ain't worth knowing, became my philosophy of life. I'm selfish, self-centered, self-seeking. According to my mother, mean as a rattlesnake, and I have yet to take a drink of alcohol. I tell people I was the perfectly tilled soil for the disease of alcoholism. All I had to do was water it, and one day I did. I got in a car with a guy whose life I lived in my head. See, I don't live in the real world with the rest of you. I live in this fantasy land in my head. And this is a guy who's got a snazzy car, pocket full of money. He runs around with the kind of girls I run away from. He's, he's known and respected in the streets already, right? He was the captain of the basketball team at Sandusky High School. He was my best friend's older brother. We all played basketball at Sandusky High School in the mid-70s. And, um, and I'm riding in the car with Johnny, and Johnny looked at me, and he said, Hey, Coleman, you want to get something to drink? Now, I had been warned about drinking. Alcoholism does not run in my family. It gallops. And I have been told we do not do alcohol well. Look at your Uncle Ed. Look at Junior. Look at Bobby. Cirrhosis, both sides of my family, right? If Johnny had said to me that day, let's go rob the carry out, I guarantee you I would have done it. Does anybody in here know what I'm talking about? I am so empty on the inside. We went through the drive through We put our money together. We bought 10 quarts of Slits Malt Liquor Bull. To the youngsters in here, the quart preceded the 40 ounce. All right, it was 32 ounces of beer. Why did we buy 10 quarts of Slits Malt Liquor Bull? Because it was on sale. More bang for your buck. We dropped the beautiful top on that. that, that he had a silver Pontiac. Boy, that thing was pretty. Quarter walls, spokes on it. Well, we dropped the convertible top on that Pontiac. He looked at me. He said, five quarts for you and five quarts for me. I said, bet. We cranked up the Parliament Funkadelic, and we rolled through the streets of Sandusky, and we drank that beer. And I found out some things that day. First thing I found out is I have a, a, a great capacity for drinking large volume of alcohol. And I found out that when you can do that amongst your peers, um, it would give you some status. I found that out that day. I have great capacity for drinking a lot of alcohol. But more than that happened that day. We rode through the streets of Sandusky and we drank that beer and my life changed. I went from shy, insecure, and afraid to bold, confident, suave, debonair, 
and absolutely fearless in about 20 minutes. We pulled behind the Derrick apartments where all the thugs hung out. I ain't said five words in public in the last three years. We pulled up, people surrounded the car, the music is blasting. I looked at Johnny, I said, Johnny, turn that music down because there's a few things I want to tell a few people who are present here this afternoon that I've been wanting to tell them for quite some time. And I went around that circle of hoodlums, told each and every one of them not only what I thought of them, but what they needed to do, in my opinion, to improve themselves. The reaction of the guys around the car, dudes is leaning in the convertible and hugging me saying, see, I told you. I told you Coleman all right. I told you he's, he's loosened up. He's drinking. He's one of us. Boom. I made it. I made it. I connected a dot. When I drink, I change. And I now have the acceptance of the people whose acceptance I want the most. That wasn't mom and dad. That was them drive-by shooters behind the Derrick apartments. Alcohol equals success. And you better believe I got it. Right? I go from what? Separation? Contact. Contact. And I got it. We left from there. We went over to the home of some of them girls he run around with I run away from. Never been over there in my life. I walked into that home like I was paying the mortgage. I walked into the dining room and I sat down at the dining room table and I looked across the room and I made eye contact with what I believe to be the finest girl to graduate from Sandusky High School in its 171 year history. I had never even breathed in her direction, much less said hello. And I looked over there at her and she looked at me and I said, come here. (laughs) And she got up and started walking toward me. Now, any sane human being would probably think to themselves, gee, Kent, if you weren't so shy and scared, look what you could have done just by speaking up. Is that what I thought? Nope. If you knew, I want you to follow me for a minute, because here's what I thought. If you had been drinking before now, look what you could have done. Look what you've been missing. Is anybody in here following this? Alcohol equals success, and you better believe I got it. Now, this is an honest program. I'm going to be honest with you all tonight. We're at the church house. When she got over there to me, I didn't have the faintest idea what to do with her. <laughs> I don't think that far ahead when I'm drinking. My story proves that, right? But I watch a lot of TV. Guys like me watch a lot of TV. On TV, they go like this. So I did. <laughs> and she sat down in my lap. And my life changed again. And the upshoot to that whole story, you know, I just seen her about two weeks ago. She's still, for anyway, uh, <laughs> the upshoot to that whole story is this. On that day, alcohol did for me what I could not or would not do for myself. I want to say this, and I want, you, I want you to understand. For the first time in my life, I felt whole. And that's a very powerful thing. And I know today that alcohol ain't supposed to do that. What happened the rest of that day? They give you the rest of my drinking history. Um, drink trouble. A lot of people come to Alcoholics Anonymous. You haven't had trouble. You haven't had DWIs, and you you know you ain't been to jail and lost jobs and been on the street. And you don't have to. The price of admission here is honesty, not the penitentiary. You can get off the elevator at any floor. You do not have to go to the basement to to accept what we have to offer here. But that is not my experience. If this was a beer, and I stood here tonight and took a drink, a cop would drop right out of that light and land in the middle of this floor. (laughs) Them old timers in Cleveland used to say, drink trouble, drink. I was like, I got that part, right? What happened the rest of that day is the rest of my drink, drink trouble. I went in a blackout. I have no idea what went on next four or five hours. According to eyewitnesses at the house, I came in, threw up a trail through the house. I went in the bathroom, hit everything but the toilet. Went in my room, passed out across the bed. The next thing that I remember is my mom knocking on that bedroom door. You know how they do. Come on here, clean up this mess. You know you've been drinking. Blah, 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 blah. I staggered into the hallway in what later years would be my drinking uniform, my underwear. And Father Pete used to say, I had a hangover you could take out and look at. I'm dying. I go in the bathroom, I lock the door, I put my hands on the bathroom sink, I looked into the mirror through bloodshot eyes, and this is what I said, man, oh man, I cannot wait to do that again. 
grounded for life is what was being discussed in the living room and how that sentence was going. I got grounded for life, right? So I'm in the bathroom and I decided to have a meeting with myself. Now, prior to AA, I love to have a meeting with myself. I have a meeting with myself. I can solve most anything that's going on. If it's over in China, wherever it is, I can figure it out. If you knew, please get a sponsor. Uh, so I decided to have a meeting with myself, and here's what I came up with in that bathroom. Okay, Ken, here's what happened. You got drunk? Yep. You got sick? Yep. You got grounded for life? Yes, all this is true. Now, the reason, Kent, that you got grounded for life is not because you got drunk. The reason that you got grounded for life is because you got sick. So what you got to do is learn how to drink, come on, without getting sick. Is anybody fun, all right? And I was gone. See, alcohol to me, from that day to about the last couple of years that I drank, alcohol's an answer for me. It's not a problem. You the problem. The police the problem. My boss is the problem. That girl is the problem. That nosy next door neighbor is the problem. Alcohol's an answer for a guy like me. And our book, it says, we were restless, irritable, and discontented until we could again experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once from taking a few drinks. When am I restless, irritable, and discontented? I'm restless, irritable, and discontented when I'm sober. My problem is I don't know how to live sober. It's, it's unbearable and untenable. Sobriety is my problem. It's not alcohol. When our book says that alcohol is but a symptom, we had to get down to causes and conditions. What is at the base? What is at the root? of this restlessness, irritable, and discontentedness. Right? And we call it the spiritual malady. You know? And I was gone. I, uh, hmm. I'm a parent abuser. You hear a lot about child abuse today? You're looking at a parent abuser. I had a car when I was 16 years old. Went to Columbus, got a fake driver's license. Said I was 22 years old. I put on a three-piece suit and tie one Saturday night and drove in a snowstorm to Toledo, Ohio and went to the all-beautiful Shea nightclub. At least that's what they call it on the radio. That ain't what it was when I got there. But right? I had a 1 a.m. curfew. And at 1 a.m. I was drinking a gin and juice and slow dragging with a woman older than my mother. I came home at 4.30 in the morning. Living room lamp is on. I walked in the front door, my mother sitting on the couch. Now, my mother was always up when I came home. Anybody else's mama up when you came home? Right? My mother, her bedroom light would be on. I come in the front door. They wouldn't give me a key to the back door because then they couldn't hear when I came in. So I come in the front door, and she said, Kenny, come here. I want to see you. Right? And I'd go stick my head around the corner. And this is what I used to say to my mother. Why are you up? For God's sake, why are you up? If y'all go somewhere, I don't sit up here at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning waiting on y'all to come home. I want you to understand the seriousness of what I'm saying to you. That is the depth of the selfishness and self-centeredness in my life. I am so self-absorbed that I cannot even conceive of the love of a parent for a child. It makes no sense to me. I think you're an idiot. I thought my parents were idiots. I got a 15-year-old daughter and a 20-year-old daughter. I didn't even want them to go to school. <laughs> you find I'm 16 years old, I'm drinking, I'm rip, ripping and running the streets, and they knew it. Why are you up? Well, I come home this night, it's 4.30, and she ain't in the bedroom. She's sitting on the couch, and I walked in the front door. My mother had tears running down her face, and this is what she told me. She said, Kenny, as your parents, we owe your roof over your head, clothes on your back, food to eat, and education, and we have done that. She said, but buddy, I got something you can't have. She said, that's my peace of mind. She said, Kenny, you're going to penitentiary or the cemetery, and I got news for you, buddy. I ain't going with you. I'm giving you to God. I'm done. Go. Do what you want. I'm done. And this is what I said to my mom. I broke you. I broke you. And, and I want you to know something, mama. you such a spiritual giant. I'm a little bit disappointed because it wasn't even that hard. And I walked away and left her. And that's how I treated my mother. How you think I treated yours? I graduated from high school and at that almost at the top of my class. And I went off to school at um, Miami of Ohio. 
the Yale of the West, they call it, one of the finer institutions of higher learning in this country. At least it was till I got there. And uh, for the next five years, my alcoholism, when I got away from any peri- If you wanted to see alcoholism in my family, the first day I went to college, it was a Sunday. My mother and father took me down there in a van with all my stuff. If you was down there that day, you would have seen babies leaving home for the first time, hugging, crying. That's what it looked like the day that freshmen go off to college. If you'd have been watching my family, you would have saw something entirely different. My father unloaded that van like his butt was on fire. They was up I-75 before I got the key in the door. The last thing my father said before he went down the steps of the dormitory was, now your mother can sleep. Now your mother can sleep. With no parental interference, my disease exploded. Um, I had shakes by the time I was 19 years old. Um, I set up headquarters at the Boar's Head Inn up on High Street. And um, I come in the Boar's Head and I told Tom, the bartender, I guess he's kind of my sponsor. I told Tom, the bartender, the Boar's Head, I think I got Parkinson's. <laughs> he looked at me and said, you're 19 years old, you got Parkinson's. I said, well, I couldn't fasten my shirt this morning. He said, ah, he said, not a problem. He said, go down to College Corner and get yourself a fifth of 100-proof old granddad, drink two shots in the morning, I guarantee your hands will stop shaking. I got the granddad, got up the next morning shaking like a leaf. I drank two shots, hands stopped shaking. You know what I said? That man's a genius. <laughs> My first sponsor pointed out to me, do you notice that you never questioned the bartender? Yet you're, you're, you had coaches, counselors, family, all these people who loved and care about you, and all you ever said to them was, I'm grown, I ain't hurting nobody, leave me alone. But you never questioned the bartender. To our new friends here tonight, why is it that I'm always willing to listen to the people who harm me? Why is that? I was an animal there. I'm still making amends to that institution to this day, and I left there in 1981, and that's a true story. And um, by the time I got out of there, I went to work in, in an auto plant. Now, you don't need a degree from a school like that to work in an auto plant. The reason that I did is because my alcoholism dictated that. Read Bill's story as his disease progresses. See, I left home like Bill. Remember when Bill went to law school and all that, and he had goals and dreams and aspirations? Bill's story is Kent's story. And I hope it's yours. But as my alcoholism progressed, I set my life up to accommodate my drinking. And when this is happening, I don't see it. I went to work in an auto plant because we made a lot of money, right? But the truth of the matter was they had something in there that I needed and I needed badly. It's called a union. And if you drink like I drink and you don't go to work like I don't go to work, you need a union, right? I worked a midnight shift because there was no bosses in there, and we drank all night on the job. I worked for a guy who drank. We protected him. He protected you. See, my life is set up like this, and the the progression continues. Um, I'll bring you up to the end of the drinking thing um, because, true, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Um, Mine ain't a happy story. Mine ain't a happy story. I'm not a, uh, uh, oh, I went through the disco days, right? I went through the disco days. I danced underneath the bubbles and all that. I did all that stuff. I went to 10 million concerts. But I'm not a guy that comes to the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous and talks to you about the good times I had drinking. My disease would love for me to do that. The truth of the matter is this, from the day I picked it up to the day I put it down, no matter what was going on in my life, I was going just like that. Alcoholism is progressive. You don't start out where you end up. I said in an AA meeting, see, because when I came to AA, I wanted your approval, right? Because I came, I was new, and I don't know you guys, so I want your approval. So when somebody would say something down at the club, and it should have been, I shouldn't have been repeating nothing that was said at the club. But when somebody at the club said something, and everybody patted them on the back, I would go to another meeting and repeat it so that people would pat me on the back. And a guy down at the club said one day, I had a good time drinking. And everybody patted him on the back. I didn't know he he meant last night. Get it? But I went to an AA meeting and I said I had a good time drinking. And that doggone Jim Redmond was there again. And again, it was not his turn to share. And he said, did you? Did you now? He said, let me ask you something, big shot. He said, if we got your mother, your father, the girl you live with, 
your, your neighbors, your co-workers, your boss, and your creditors in here. And we said, you know, Ken had a really good time out there drinking. What kind of time did you guys have? What do you think they'd say? I said, I don't want to have that meeting. <laughs> I never looked at it like that. He said, I know you didn't because you can't see beyond your own face. You're so full of you. I don't go around talking about the good times I had. I'm a guy who hurts people. I hurt people badly. Have, have you had a good time drinking? Go drink. I, uh, I won't get into all the, the, the crap, um, I will say I, I've been convicted of driving under the influence of alcohol seven times in the state of Ohio. Those are convictions, not arrests. I could paper the walls with the arrests. I used to get off for reckless out. Seven convictions for driving under the influence. If they had the laws back then that they have today, I'd still be in the penitentiary, and rightly so. I've been cut out of cars. I dropped dead of a heart attack at the age of 26. 26 years old one day, I just dropped dead. Upset my girlfriend a great deal. <laughs> Called the rescue squad. They put the paddles on me. Put me into the cardiac unit. My whole family up there. My mother telling the doctor, I already lost my oldest son. I can't lose another one. Chaos. They talk about the alcoholic being a tornado roaring through the lives of others. You're looking at a cyclone, Jack. Chaos. 48 hours, my heartbeat stabilizes. Miracle, they said. Put me in a regular room. Two hours later, I'm drunk. You know what I thought when they put me in a regular room? Now, when I'm in the cardiac unit, I got tears running down my face. God, if you let me live, I'll never drink again. You put a lie detector on me, wouldn't have moved. I meant it. I didn't want to die any more than I did today. They took me out of the, the cardiac unit, put me in a regular room. Here's the thought that come to me. If you knew, come with me for a minute. Whoo, that was close. <laughs> but I'm all right now. This calls. For a celebration. Oh, is anybody right? And my buddy Mark, who on September the 5th, um, it was 17 years ago that Mark died drunk on the railroad tracks, came into that room, my best drinking buddy, and I told him to go get me some booze, and he said, if you think I'm going to do that, you're out of your mind. This is the guy that died of this disease. And I told him, you're going to need me before I need you. Go do what I told you to do. And I was drunk in that hospital room two hours out of the cardiac unit. And I didn't do that because I'd rather be drunk than sober. I didn't do that because I'd rather be dead than alive. I did it because I'm powerless over alcohol and my life had become unmanageable. If I could choose to stop drinking and stop drinking, I wouldn't need AA. One of the worst statements made in here. I've been convicted on felony weapon and drug charges in the state. Well, I've been in a lot of trouble. It means nothing. You don't have to go through none of that. At the end of my drinking, no baths, no showers. I'm going to work two or three days a week. I got a liver that's distended about seven inches. I'm on a period of indefinite probation in Erie County. Now, that's possible. They can actually do that. Um, I stood in front of a judge who sentenced me to five years in the state penitentiary in Mansfield. And she said to me, I know your, your uncle, I know your mother, I know your father. You have a good education and you have a job. Before I throw you away, I'm going to place you on a period of indefinite probation. I went to protest that and my lawyer kicked me. And uh, she said, a dirty urine so much as an aspirin and you're gone. I got off work the next Friday morning to go report at adult probation. My first time to report. I got an hour to kill before they open adult probation. I work midnights. I'm driving across town. Here's the thought that came to me. You know they say they never test you on your first time reporting. They don't think anybody's that stupid. Who is they? Does anybody follow this? Who is they? I pulled in the Super Bowl Tavern and I staggered into adult probation with five years over my head for a dirty urine Not because I'd rather be in prison than be free. I did it because I'm powerless over alcohol. And my life had become unmanageable. 
At the end, no baths, no showers. I got a liver that's distended about seven inches. Every time I take a drink of whiskey, I cough all this white stuff up. My liver and my pancreas has, were ceasing to function. They would no longer metabolize the alcohol that I was drinking. What I'm coughing up is pure alcohol. My body is now rejecting what my mind is obsessed with. I'm 32 years old and I'm dying of alcoholism. The last three years, I tried everything I could think of to stop drinking. I went back to church. I quit hanging around them guys. I got the booze out of the house. I changed shifts at work. I, I sit up at night with a Bible in this hand and a Miller High Life in this hand. And I couldn't shut it off. I was drunk every day. Um, in the last year, I just gave up. Um, I came to believe that there are some people that just die of this, don't understand it. I had uncles die of it, and I guess I'm one of them people. And, um, and I went to the, to the land of I don't care. Um, and I never want to forget what I was like when I got here. There was no day, no night, no right, no wrong, no good, no evil, no God, no devil. The three most prominent words in my vocabulary were I don't care. And I believe that that's as far away from God as a human being can get. And that's what I was like when I came to y'all. I come out of the pump lounge one night. I had what they call a moment of clarity or a moment of sanity. There's a guy in Cleveland, six-pack Charlie Kitchen. Charlie says that's the moment when God paralyzes the liar in you long enough for you to see the truth. And I came out of the pump lounge and got in the car. And for the first time in almost 20 years, my head completely cleared. And this is what I saw. If you don't stop drinking, you're going to die. And you better get some help because you can't do it by yourself. And you better do it now because you're running out of time. Out of nowhere. And I went home and I called my best drinking buddy from college today who was a doctor and whose house is bigger than five churches like this. And he's a very powerful and successful man. I owed him five grand, didn't even know if he'd take a call from me. And um, he an his wife answered the phone. She said, Richard is Kent. And that's exactly how she said it. <laughs> and Richard got on the phone and I said, Rich, it's your boy, man. I need some help. And this is what he said to me. He said, man, I've been waiting for this call for seven or eight years. Pack a bag. Stay by the phone. I got you. And he is not a member of this fellowship. When I get a call from the North Central Intergroup Office of Alcoholics Anonymous in Ohio at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know what I tell the person on the other end, don't you? Pack a bag. Stay by the phone. I got you. And for that, I am responsible. I, uh, he told me don't go to work. They're going to fire you. He wanted me to come down there. He lived in Centerville outside of Dayton. Um, we drove down there the next morning, my brother and his wife in the front seat, I'm in the back seat with a case of Genesee beer. Now, I didn't know too much about treatment, but I had figured out on my own they wasn't serving no liquor down there. <laughs> we speeding down I-75, I got two or three of them cold Jennies in me, and I had a visit from the enemy, my thinking, and here's the thought that occurred to me at that point. You know, I just may have overreacted here. <laughs> it ain't that bad, right? I want y'all to understand something. I worked at Ford Motor Company. I did not have a car. <laughs> I'm serious. I didn't, I worked at Ford. I didn't have a car. My mother had to go buy me underwear and socks to go to treatment. I made as much money as my mother and father. I may have overreacted here. What I didn't know is my father told my brother, I give you $100, you don't bring that tramp back to town. That's a true story. My brother wanted that honey. He wouldn't turn around. We got down to Richard's house and uh, Richard put me in his car. Richard had a Porsche. He had a Porsche. And Richard put me in his car. And, uh, I was knee walking drunk. And he took me and he bought me a quarter Miller's for the trip. It's about a half an hour to Xenia. And um, he looked at me and he said, uh, it was always your favorite. Here's a quart. And we pulled in the parking lot of Green Memorial Hospital. He put his car in park. I had about this much left in that court. He looked at me. He said, go ahead, dog. Finish that. And don't ask me how I know it, man. He said, that's the last drink you're ever going to take. The 17th of May, 1992, I have not had another drop of alcohol or anything stronger than the aspirin since that day, and I never would have believed it possible. I woke up the next morning in detox. May 18th, 1992, I did not know that was to be my sobriety date. I did not know what a sobriety date was, nor did I care. Um, by the time I got out of the detox, they sent me to something called men's group. They had a circle of men sitting in the morning reading stories of their drinking escapades in the streets. The counselor says, Kent, what do you think about what you heard here today? I said, I'll tell you what I think about what I heard, Jim. <laughs> well, I'm down here for a few days to get help for this small problem I might have. I would like to volunteer my time and services and energy to help you with these people. These are the sickest people I've ever seen in my life. 
that one statement got me an extra week of treatment. I spent 35 days in a 28-day program. The next morning, they took me down to nurse's station where my enemy married a nurse, hung a sign around my neck this big and said, I am not a counselor. I had to wear it for a whole week. <laughs> I do treatment good. Next day, Jim had me write and read to the group. I did. I got done. He said, put your chair in the middle of the room. Let's make a circle around Kent and tell him what we think of him. I think Kent's so full of BS. His eyes are turning brown. If you threw him in water, he'd float away. That was the nicest thing that was said in that room that day. And what them guys told me it was if I didn't get honest with myself, I was going to leave that place and I was going to die. And for some reason, God, thank you. I believed him. I believed him. I got out of treatment. I came home. I played a game. It's a very dangerous game. It's called don't drink, go to meetings, and don't do nothing else. And um, if I put my arm through a window and I cut an artery in my arm, I start bleeding all over the floor. I put a towel on my arm. I drive myself to the hospital. I run in the emergency room. I sit down. I'm bleeding all over the floor. A doctor comes out and says, come on back, Mr. Coleman. We'll treat you now. I sit there bleeding to death. Look at the doctor and say, no, thank you. I'll just sit here. And I bleed to death in the emergency room. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the emergency room. I have attended meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've watched people die who attend these meetings on a daily basis. The treatment for the disease I suffer from is a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, period. There's a lot of stuff in here I talked about earlier that support that process. But the bottom line is a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. I went to over 250 AA meetings in three months, and I ended up up in the parking lot of Daly's Pub in downtown Sandusky, vibrating. I wanted to drink so bad. See, when I stop drinking, I don't get better. When I stop drinking and I don't treat my illness, I get worse. Is anybody in here like me? And I'm at work and people are telling me, you ain't had a drink in two months, you need one, you're driving us all crazy, right? And, and, and it just grew every day and it grew every day and I got angrier at the meetings. There was a man, I told you, John Cunningham. John was in my home group when I got a home group. John got sober in 1945. He knew Dr. Bob. We were at the Wednesday night, 12 and 12. He pointed his finger at me. He says, you're going to be drunk in three months if you don't do something. He says, you're not the potential. You're the actual son. You're the guy they talk about in that book. And time's running out. And three months and 250 meetings, and I'm sitting in the parking lot at Daly's Pub, and I'm like, what am I, some kind of freak? I go to three meetings a day. And I said my first prayer in Alcoholics Anonymous, three months sober, sitting in a car in the parking lot of a bar, and this was the prayer, God, what am I doing wrong? And like a lightning bolt, I got an answer, what are you doing right? If you go to that many meetings, you hear it every day, don't you? Get a sponsor, read the book, work the steps, get a hunger, help others, right? I treated A like a cigarette smoking donut dunking coffee clutch. I didn't do none of that stuff. And instead of going into Daly's Pub, I turned the key and I drove to Lorraine, Ohio, 25 years, 25 miles away, and I went looking for Bill Finley, uh, a man who spent his life doing this and traveling the world and doing big book. And they told me that he's the guy to help you. John said, he specializes in guys like you. <laughs> and I went looking for Bill Finley and, and, and I, or Kenny Bombalicki. I had met Kenny and they used to go. Bill's home group was 600 people in the gym on Thursday night in Lorraine, Ohio. And he used to sit in the back with his arms folded, and smiling and watching all the action go on. He was something else. And I walked in there, and Bill and Kenny were sitting together, and they were laughing at me as I walked toward them. And, uh, and I said, would you help me? And Bill looked at me, and he said, listen. He said, um, I'm going to take you through the steps the way that my sponsor did with me. His sponsor was one of the first hundred members of AA. He said, son, he said, I want you to bury yourself knee deep. He said, no. Nah. He said, forget that. He said, I want you to bury yourself shoulder deep in this thing called AA so you can't teeter and fall. And I've been shoulder deep in Alcoholics Anonymous from that day to this. And my sponsor took me through the steps of this program as I live them in my life today imperfectly. Um, I had an opportunity to make amends to my parents before they, my mother died. I was about almost two years sober. My mother had bone cancer and I moved back into my mom and dad's house to help my dad take care of my mom. And my dad, I was barred, banned from their house for stealing. And, um, and they let me come back. And every day I helped my dad take care of my mom. My mom saw me go to all them AA meetings. My mama saw me bring my first sponsees to her dining room table and open up the big book and talk about God. My mama saw me put on a shirt and a tie and go speak at AA meetings when I didn't even have a suit. And, um, when she got close to the end, my sponsor said, now I want you to go make you direct. He wouldn't allow me to say anything. He wanted my feet to do the talking. 
he always told me, recovery's in your feet, son. It ain't in your head. And, um, and I went to the hospital. They got her off the morphine. I had a big speech planned out. I sat down with my mom. She looked at me. I looked at her. And um, the only thing that would come out of my mouth was, Mom, I'm sorry. And my mother had them big brown eyes, and the tears was flowing down her face, and she smiled at me. I done told my mama, I'm sorry, a million times, but it came from my head, not from my heart. When it came from my spirit, because of these steps, my mother felt me. Because what comes from the heart reaches the heart. And my mother said, I forgive you. She said, Kenny, I want you to promise me you'll stay with those people in AA. They were able to do for you what we could not. They were the answer to our prayer. I promised her that I would, and I have. My dad died. I was 17 years sober. My dad saw a lot. Um, got married at three and a half years sober. Um, I got, he saw the birth of my two little girls. My two little girls loved their granddaddy. My oldest daughter said to me one time, is granddaddy your daddy? I said, no, honey. Granddaddy is a fictional character. That is not the same man who lived in the house with me. Right? They go to my father's house, just trash his living room. He sit there. Oh, <laughs> My dad was a good guy. Well, my dad told me one time, said, boy, you made me hang my head. I fought for my country. I went to, my father worked at General Motors for 42 years, never missed a day's work. And I did something one time, it was on the front page of the Sandusky Register. My father said, boy, you made me hang my head today. How do you make amends for that? You know? I was sober one year, and there's a guy that he worked with named Joe. And uh, Joe uh, came to me and told me this after my father died. He said, Kent, the day you had a year, so your father came up to me at work and said, hey, Joe, do you know my boy? I said, yeah, Pete, I know him. He said, your dad looked at me and said, man, ain't he something. Don't talk to me about what can't happen here. My father died. There was nothing left between me and him, nothing. I got divorced at 20 years sober. Um, I married a woman who's in this program. She's still in it. She's a good member. She's sober 26 years, just didn't work out. And uh, I moved to Las Vegas. I thought that's what you do. You get divorced, you go to Las Vegas. Anyway, I, <laughs> I went to Las Vegas to run a company. I retired from Ford um, in uh, 2007. I went out there to run a company that's based out of Michigan. And uh, my sponsor, Bob, was there, so that was really cool. I was a member of Connected Dots in Las Vegas. And I came back to Ohio because I was too far away from my daughters. They were not old enough for me to be that far away. So I stayed in Vegas for a couple of years. Now I'm back in Ohio, and I'm a buyer for a big automotive company. I'm retired, but I'm going to be working for a while. My baby still got to go to college. She's only 15, and I'm okay because I don't need too much time on my hands. I guess you can understand why. <laughs> right? But um, I've been shoulder deep in AA. I'm a managing trustee at Dr. Bob's Home in Akron. I, I've been involved in so many wonderful things in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been institutional committee chair. I've been involved in service. Um, it's just it's. Um, if you're new here, I want to share something with you, and I'm going to get up out of here. Um, they gave me a ch tape of a man named Warren Chisholm Sr., 12th man in AA in Cleveland, a great speaker, got sober in 1939. Warren Chisholm Sr. made this statement that anyone who comes here who is willing to practice the principles and precepts of this program as outlined by the founders in the big book need never drink again one day at a time. I'm listening to him on a tape working at work on the line at Ford. I went to my sponsor, who was a friend of this guy, and I said, he can't say that, Bill, never drink again a day at a time. Bill said, yes, he can, son. He said, I'm going to tell you why I can say it. He said, because this is a spiritual program. God doesn't fail. There is no failure here. If this doesn't work for you, it's because you have not fulfilled the conditions that have been laid down. You have to participate in your own recovery. Those who do get and those who don't, don't. And it's just that simple. If I said anything that helped anybody tonight, thank God, do not thank me. If I didn't say nothing to help you tonight, guess what? There's some more meetings tomorrow. <laughs> God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him. God could and would, if he were sought, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely Meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Good night, Seattle.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.